and welcome to Shelburne Farms. I think we all will agree that we are extremely lucky to have such a beautiful setting to show the, to introduce you to this evening, the Common Roots Program. But more so, we're lucky to have a center of learning, a place where young and old come and learn together and work together and look at all kinds of problems that we face and try to come up with solutions. We're talking about national, local, and global problems. Some of you were here a little less than six years ago and probably remember that night, and I was just talking to Lois McClure and she remembers that night, when it was 98 degrees in this room. We had someone faint, we had an ambulance, and, um, but it was a wonderful evening in that it was the premiere, the Vermont premiere of The Last Link film, which is a film that my son and I made <clears throat> to chronicle a story that has been in my heart for years. It's a story that tells the fight for survival of a once vibrant agricultural culture that relied on hard work, community life, caring for land and animals, and pride in what one did. And challenged by the rapidly changing world with shifting values, the film traces the voyage of an 84-year-old sheep herder from Buffalo, Wyoming, as he goes to see and touch the land of his ancestors, the land he wants to see before the end of his life. I've traveled many places with this film. We just got back from the New York premiere last night, and it's, I've been abroad with it too. And something that has struck me wherever I show it, the reaction is similar. I have people come and tell me about their own experience that relates to what they've seen in the film and what has meant that this has been filmed and is traveling and people are, are talking about it. And there's one recurrent question that comes up time after time. What can be done to turn things around? How can we build the feeling of community? How can we bring the family farm back? How can we reconnect with the land? At the end of the film, Willie Nelson asks us this question in a different way. He says, what stand are we willing to take to preserve for our future the roots of our past? The answer can be found in a quote that I remember as a 20-year-old in, in college, high school, that would be a long high school experience, 20-year-old <laughs> in college, by Mahatma Gandhi. He said, we must become the change we want to see in the world. And so that's influenced my life. I've loved my teaching, and I've loved going around and working in community projects with my students. Tonight, we will hear about one such project, a project that is bold and important, a project that is, an, is a call to action. It is a project that, in part, came out from the film. And the educational initiative, thanks to the Vermont Department of Education and many other foundations that help teachers, students, business people, farmers come together and look at the natural, social, and environmental needs and formulate action plans. It has been six years since we were in this room, and we've come a long way since that time. And now you will hear about this extraordinary K University program called Common Roots, and that has been forged during those six years, and it is ready to share with you tonight. Before we move to that part of the program, we want to share with you a legacy that my wife, Fran, and I experienced in the 1970s when we lived and worked with the shepherds at 9,000 feet in the French Pyrenees. It has a large tap root. And that's why I like the expression common roots, because it has a very long, almost a prehistoric times tap root. And it is an inspiration, in part, for the Common Roots Project. We have with us tonight three shepherds, singing shepherds from the French Pyrenees. And he, in 2003, they were here for the celebration of the premiere of the film. And they remind us in their songs of the crucial role about preserving human and environmental 
resources for the future. In their magnificent mountains where iris and rhododendrons and edelweiss bloom in abundance, their songs fill the night air as they sing in cafes or around campfires. These songs have been passed down from generation to generation and celebrate community, nature, and cherished land and animals. They have come to, get, with, to us again now, six years later, with gifts from their mountains. This is the Peak de Midi do Sou, which frames their valley. They have come to, to us tonight with gifts from this valley to show their heartfelt connection to a powerful past we share and a future we must, we must forge together. It is with great pleasure, and I consider them my brothers, that I, they have come tonight to continue to celebrate a, a work that we began many, many years ago. And it is especially poignant tonight I, that I have learned just recently that one of the shepherds with whom Fran and I worked died this week. And before he died, he sent along something to be here tonight. So it's with great pleasure that I introduce the group, Estar, and they will, they will sing as they do every June, as they come down from the mountain with their sheep. You hear their voices and you hear the sound of them echoing before they arrive at the village. That's the call to community. That's the call to come and celebrate the land. And they will enter as they traditionally do with their instruments, followed by a procession of people who join behind them until they get to the village square. So would you please join me in welcoming the three singing shelpers of the group Estar.
those who didn't know, they were singing an ode to these mountains, mountains, the Pyrenees Mountains. And now they want to sing a song to begin the evening about spring, which we're all about to experience. And so they're wishing us the best, warmest, be most beautiful spring with this song. present one of the people who represent part of the Common Roots uh, initiative with a gift from the Pyrenees Mountains. First, I'm going to call on Gabrielle and Charlotte to come forward with what I talked about. Uh, if you just come to me here, this is very fragile and somehow it made it across the Atlantic. This is an Edelweiss flower that was pressed by the shepherd who just died, and it was for the project. And so, Jean, if you would present this to them. Jean is putting his hand on it to bless it, and he will then embrace. Thank you. Thank you. Now, Eric, if you step down, please, and Kelsey and Connor come forward, and I'll explain to everybody what this is. This is a beautifully hand-carved echer. The echer is the form that you press the cheese into as you're making it. And in it, it gathers the, what they call the petit lait, which is the small milk, which they, as you know, learn when you live with shepherds, you know they lear, you learn they, they waste nothing. So the petit lait goes to feed the pigs, and the pigs go to feed the shepherds, and it's a complete circle. So this is a beautifully carved, representing the forest, a share, excuse me for one second, Kelsey. And the shepherd who sent this said, my heart is in the forest. And there's a heart he had put into this for the project. So this is for the project Common Roots.
And the last thing is a, has, has a wonderful history to it. Jean-Luc is going to present it, and, and I wanted Jean-Luc to do this because this is my French brother, and he's the one that wrote much of the music in the film, and he composed some of the music you're going to hear later in the evening. He's a very talented young man. He made all these instruments that are modeled on the 13th century. Stéphane was going to be here also, but Stéphane had to go back to France because of a medical emergency. So he said to me as I took him to Kennedy Airport three nights ago, he said, you tell the people who come to that meeting Tell them my words, and they're very simple. Humankind is nothing without the earth. And then he waved goodbye and got on his plane. So he, if you step up, Greg, I'll explain what this is. This beautiful piece of slate is the type of roofing that is used in their part of France. It's called a loz, and it is from a 400-year-old farm. Stéphane got it and had it engraved with the following words. First of all, up here you have the Bernay saying, and then beneath it is the French translation, which reads, la terre et l'âme racine commune, the earth and the soul, these are our common roots. And this is very, very special, and I know it will mean a lot to the many students and community members who work on this project. So. Thank you very much. It's with great gratitude on behalf of Common Roots, our new nonprofit that is formed to be stewards of the earth for our future. On behalf of the full community of Common Roots, we say thank you from our hearts with great gratitude. We welcome you to this celebration of Common Roots. Tonight we will share our vision and mission with you as we are prepared to enhance the soil and soul of this community at large. Our goal is that you would tonight want to be partners with us in our mission. I'd like to begin by introducing our board of directors. We have John Everett, our superintendent of South Burlington Schools as a board member. We have Terry Donovan and Peter Jones. Where's Peter? There he is. We have Leah Mattel Skiff, Rob Skiff, and we have Janet Stambolian. I'm Carol McQuillan, and I will be the beginning chair for Common Roots. We'd like to begin, as we have uh, thanked our shepherds and song singers tonight, we'd like to begin with a few gratitudes for all of the people and committees that have brought us to this point, people who have worked with us from the very foundational parts of Common Roots um, that brought us from the Beans Greens to the Slimy Committee to now the Strategic Plan of South Burlington School. Our fourth of four goals is building a more sustainable community. And with the people that have gone before this founding evening tonight, um, we say thank you. For tonight's event, we would like to be uh, full of gratitude <laughs> because it has been in every juncture a uh, gracious outpouring to us. Steve Redman of Kindred Design is our graphic artist, who you'll see his handiwork in all of our communications. American Flatbread for the gift of their food and their chefs tonight. Kathy Dunham, a parent and community member with her daughter Addie, who prepared the lovely hors d'oeuvres. RETN for recording this tonight, Jay Hoffman, my colleague, good friend, and partner in crime. Um, we're always collaborating um, for different ideas, but he's our full technical support tonight, which I am not. Um, and then we also would like to thank Michael Worthington and George Chamberlain, our photographers. And then, even while I was presenting in New York last week, I had these semester-long dizzy bees, uh, UVM interns from Matt Cullen's course, um, Caitlin and Paige, who held lots of things together in my absence and who came through with 
very shining colors for us. We thank both Paige and Caitlin and the other interns here tonight. And of course, uh, for Megan Camp, who's been with us from the conception in the early stages of our work towards sustainability, a mentor and, and now an advisor for us. We're very grateful. And to this place, Shelburne Farms, that is part of the inspiration for many of us to be thinking forward for our future, We'd like to also uh, be thankful for the warmth of and Andrea Van Hoven, who is the events coordinator here, who helped us put all of this together, courtesy of Shelburne Farms. So we thank all of you. The components of tonight's presentation, to give you a little sneak preview, we know as teachers that when you know what's coming ahead, it prepares your thinking. It's called a comprehension strategy. So I'm going to warm you up. Terry will be presenting the evolution and, and uh, the foundations of Common Roots. We have two important segments tonight of the work that's been done by our University of Vermont students in their graduate studies. We, um, that connects uh, the Leduc farm uh, and the, the work of our looking forward to this land for our community. Leah Mattel Skiff will focus on programming. I'll have a few closing comments. Then the Astar Singers will end the event. But we'd like you to stay for more food, dessert, and mingling. The, um, the evolution that most people don't know happened way before I became a teacher. I'm a kindergarten and first grade teacher at Orchard School. I've been there, I believe, my 11th year now. But um, before I came to the school, there was a lovely request for community partnership. And a woman by the name of Sabrina Joy filled out her little partnership questionnaire. What would you like to offer our schools to enhance our community? And she became the first plant lady in South Burlington. Would you stand up, Sabrina? Can you come up here? She even has green hair. So <laughs> the children of South Burlington, when they see my, our plant lady, they still know her by her green hair and her name. But uh, she began windowsill gardens with green beans crawling up the windows. <laughs> and then she and her husband and community members and teachers started up the grow labs. And then she taught a course with our good friends, uh, Martin Kiefer and uh, Martin Kempel. Joseph Kiefer. Joseph Kiefer and Martin Kempel from Foodworks and trained some of our teachers, who two of them are here tonight, around the practice of becoming a master gardener. And from that work, we now at Orchard School have 10 gardens, three of them connected with food and curriculum. And it really began way before me with this little green seed, Sabrina Joy. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you. Thank you. And then along with the inspiration of the Last Link film, I can't uh, ever speak about Common Roots without the evening or the day-long program here at Shelburne Farms. In the year 2001, two days before 9-11, when 2,000 people processed in silence at the break of day, and we came down through a spiral of wheat under the tenant of the community of the communication for the Earth Charter, written, tree dancers from New York City entering the breeding barn with Paul Winter in concert. Stephen Rockefeller unpacked the main tenants of the Earth Charter. And by noontime, I was mush. <laughs> but I listened to the conversation that Jane Goodall had with our middle schoolers and high schoolers in the community and saw the area schools children with three-dimensional masks of animals from all the planets of our earth. And families, multicultural families dancing in their native dress with their children, the Essex children, Children's Choir in song. But for me, there was this, a quintessential moment. I was sitting next to Fran Khan. And Satish Kumar, a beautiful man from India who walked from the grave of Gandhi to the grave of John F. Kennedy minus the ocean, who now teaches at Schumacher College in England. He said, while Americans are 
focused on their body, mind, and spirit, that's very well and good, as we should. I'd like to stretch Americans and citizens of the world to consider that perhaps the reason that we take care of our body, mind, and spirit is in order to care for the soil, the soul, and society. So at that moment, um, old Mrs. McQuillan, at 95 years old, <laughs> had this little shift inside of me that wouldn't go away. And so I had to pay attention to it. Another mother presented the same evening at our PTO meeting at Orchard School. And we got together and we said, you know, we have kindred goals here. And our Sustainable Living Committee was founded then just about seven years ago. Is that right, Matt? Seven, eight years ago. So tonight is uh, the, the, um, the, the thread that keeps weaving to building a more sustainable future for our children and for our planet. So I'd like to introduce you to our good friend, Terry. I've been asked to um, give a little bit of background about Common Roots and to take you on the journey that we've been to so far. Um, by way of introduction, uh, my name is Terry Donovan. I'm a resident of South Burlington. I live there with my husband, Peter, and our two kids, Evan and Anna. And um, we moved to Vermont about eight years ago. So I confess I'm a flatlander. Is anybody else out there a flatlander? <laughs> But I have to confess, too, I am the flattest of flatlanders because my family roots are from a small farm in Iowa where my grandmother grew up in, and uh, our family grew from, that, from there. Um, I often think about, when I think about my grandmother, she was born in the early 1900s, and I think about the amazing changes that she's seen in her lifetime, probably more than any changes any other generation has seen. And you think about the things that have changed. So since the early 1900s, we've had radio, TV was invented, the internet, totally changing the way we communicate with each other. We've had huge changes in how we travel. Um, right now, almost any one of us could go to the Burlington, Burlington Airport and fly almost anywhere in the world within three days. We've had huge change in progress in medicine and food production. But, and a lot of people would say that we're much better off for all of those things. But I'd like to ask us to consider, have we lost anything during that period? And I'm going to show you a few slides about to help us to contemplate things that we might have lost and, and how to regain some of those. <clears throat> Since the 1900s, uh, we've added about 200 million people to the United States, and we're still growing. As we try to provide housing and things like that for people to, to persist, um, we also have to keep in mind that the land is always providing us with our sustenance. We are totally dependent upon the land. By, between now and 1950, we're expected to develop another chunk of land approximately the size of Pennsylvania to accommodate our growing population. So as we consider that, let's, let's look back and think about our relationship to the land and how to preserve that. When my grandmother was uh, a child, uh, there was no such thing as fast food. And also there was no problem with childhood obesity. Since the 1960s, the obesity rate in children has tripled, and one in four of our students in Vermont are either overweight or at risk of being overweight. And I think that although it's okay to eat those foods occasionally, I know I do, I think we need to just keep in mind that our bodies are made to eat real food that is unprocessed. Also in my grandmother's day, um, they never had school lunches. They packed their lunches in a pail and trotted off to school. And so the, the lessons about how to live and how to eat were pr primarily driven by parents. 
Today we've given a lot of that responsibility to schools and our schools are struggling with this um, really difficult economy where the, the worst foods that we can be serving are often the cheapest. And so a lot of schools are serving foods that look like this and are making a strategic move to uh, move in the right direction and serve meals like these. When my grandmother was young, she, um, she stopped her schooling when she was in sixth grade. And um, we can't use that excuse anymore. Uh, but we are losing some children, and some kids are not being connected through the schooling that they receive. And uh, if you ask, well, what are they connected to? Richard Louvre would say they're so connected to the internet and television, they're spending 44 hours a week um, doing those kinds of activities that they've totally lost their connection to the natural world. <clears throat> We also have that problem as adults. I know that if you ask me what the weather was like going to be tomorrow, I would say, well, I'll, I'll go look and watch the news later on tonight, instead of looking to the skies like our ancestors have done. We need to regain that, reconnect with the cycles of the earth. It also wasn't very long ago when most of the American families knew exactly where their food was grown. They either knew the farmer who was growing their food, uh, or in some cases they knew the name of the pig or the cow that was gracing their plate. <clears throat> um, today we live in a society where our food is really corporatized, and we need to regain that connection to where our food was grown and understanding who is growing our food and where it comes from. I know for me, I have no clue where most of the food that I consume today has come from. Although I do know from, from tonight, flatbread. <laughs> um, as part of that food system, our food travels an enormous distance from farm to plate, by some estimates over a thousand miles for a typical meal. We spend an enormous amount of energy taking, um, taking the food that is grown on, on farmlands uh, packaging it and preparing it and then shipping it. And then at the same time we wonder why we're having problems with our air and why rates of asthma are so high. We need to think really constructively about how to re-engage into a more local economy. And finally, um, in, in the old days, um, the intergenerational family was the norm. It wasn't the exception. Today, it's the exception. And while it's great to have our seniors uh, engaged and participating in this new technology, these are the people we need most of all to show us how to get back on track because those are the people who have lived in a connected society before things had changed so rapidly. So, um, so where do we go? Um, well, Tim mentioned that, uh, that he, there's a famous saying by Gandhi that says, um, be the change you wish to see in the world. And um, that's great for Tim, but for me personally, I find that paralyzing. I, I don't know whether I should gather up all my relatives and move out into the frontier and try to do some homesteading. Um, so I prefer the blue collar version of that, which is, you're either on the road moving forward or you're part of the pavement. <laughs> and so <laughs> when my son Evan entered, um, entered kindergarten in the, in the school district, my husband Peter and I joined the SLIMY group that Carol mentioned. SLIMY stands for Sustainable Living Initiatives Motivating Youth. And it was a group of parents and teachers that had a common goal that it, were really concerned about these crises of our time and, and thinking about this in a, in a really constructive way. Um, as Carol mentioned, um, Sabrina Joy Milbury and Connie Keetel were key players of that. And I, and I would just like to say, for me personally, I worked with their, I found that that to be a very, very inspiring group of parents and teachers to work with. Um, people like Frank Geyer, who's here, um, Nancy Helen, Janet Stambolian, um, and MJ Riel are some of the people in our group that worked, did a lot of work. At our first meeting in Slimy, I won't forget this, um, we started talking about these issues and we discussed the fact that, you know, the good thing about all these problems today is that they're all connected and so, therefore, if, 
if you find a good solution for one thing, it's likely to spill over and affect in positive ways other things too. So for example, if we were to um, have walking school buses for neighborhoods near school districts, we could combat childhood obesity problems while at the same time being more friendly to the environment. And at that meeting, one of the ideas that came up was the idea of a community farm and how a farm that's local could also, in one fell swoop, begin to address a lot of these problems at the same time. We could engage kids um, in the farming activity and reconnect them to the land. In doing so, we can have them eating more healthy foods. Better yet, let's engage the whole community so that our kids can connect with our elders in our society and we can begin to forge more connections between people as well. So, um, so along the way we had a few kind of stops and stutters. We agreed that this farm idea was a good idea and we started to work with many, many professors and students and teachers from the University of Vermont. I'd like to name some of those folks here. Rule Bowmans, Alan Matthews, Matt Colin, Kate Westdyke, Tom Hudspeth, Walter Pullman, Sarah Lovell, John Todd, Amy Trubeck, and Lenny Wollenberg. And through these, these, this group of professors, we've had a lot of background information building up and helping us to think about what a program, a good farm program would look like. In the meantime, more people joined the slimy group, um, Heather Bates, um, Leah, and Rob Skiff, and even additional parents joined in this, this same um, movement through the South Burlington Strategic Plan, of which school foods and green schools were two of the major initiatives. So um, we weren't really, con we didn't really have a plan for where this farm would be, but uh, several years ago, Sarah Dopp and the South Burlington Land Trust started initiating conversations with the LaDuke family about conserving their farm. And so suddenly there was an opportunity for us to, to seize the day and think more proactively about how to make this dream a reality. Um, the LaDuke property, um, we'll talk about a lot the rest of this evening, is a 143 acre farm that is in South Burlington and Shelburne. And um, the deal was secured through the Vermont Land Trust. Um, they kind of, they conserved the land um, by contributions from the city of South Burlington and the town of Shelburne and the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board. And what normally happens after the land trust has secured those properties is they, they want to turn it over to a farmer to maintain that land uh, in, for agricultural use. They don't want to be the landowner. Their mission is to conserve land and then see it um, carried forth from there. And so the Slimy Group um, began to talk with the land trust about our vision for a community farm. And they were very, very enthusiastic and supportive. And they said that we would have a, an opportunity to, um, to attain this farm if we could present a good plan, a good strategic plan, and get our ducks in order. And <clears throat> so in order to do that, we need to have a legal mechanism by which we could secure the land. And that's how Common Roots was born. It's a 501c3, and we've formalized our whole group. So, we are slimy junior. <laughs> um, so here's the mission of Common Roots. I'm going to read this with you. I, it's okay. I, I, we worked really hard on getting this mission statement right. Common Roots connects farmers, educators, youth, and community members to build a sustainable future through place-based educational and service programs. By collectively growing food for our schools, kitchens, and food shelves, we celebrate the soil and soul of community. Our stewardship provides food security, affirms our local environment, and nurtures our common roots. And we'll be talking, um, uh, Leah will be talking a lot more about the program vision for common roots, but I want to just say here that it has five elements, local food security, place-based education, natural resource stewardship, community engagement, and sustainability. And um, our next presenters are going to be talking in depth about the LaDuke property, 
what an amazing gift the Leduc family has given to our communities. And these, you can kind of keep these points in the back of your head as they go through this talk. So our next speaker is uh, Teague O'Connor. Um, Teague is a student um, of Walter Pullman in the, in the PLACE program, which is a collaborator of Shelburne Farms. And he's going to be presenting an overview about this place called the Leduc property and the context in which it resides in. And then following T, Grafter Ferguson will be um, giving us a, a, an overview of some of the preliminary site development plans um, that would engage these programs at, at, for, uh, on behalf of Common Roots. So. Well, thank you, Terry. Um, so to start, uh, I was told by a teacher that when you give a presentation, if you're nervous, and I'm pretty nervous, you're supposed to start with something that you know. So something that I know is on the way over here today, I saw a bobcat while driving with Dave and uh, Rafter. And I went up to Terry, and I just met her this evening, and I was like, Terry, I saw a bobcat out there. And she's like, oh, great. You know, I work on, uh, one of my students is working on a bobcat tracking program. So we started talking a little bit about that. And through this observation and something that I was excited about, I was able then to sort of bridge this gap and share an experience and sort of build a bond. And so what I'm going to try and do is show something with you that I'm excited about. And it's this semester I've been working with Walt Pullman through this class, Place-Based Landscape Analysis, to look at the Leduc and Bandel Farms. And Bandel Farm is the, the site where Sarah Dopp lives. So we've been looking at that, and something else I know is that I only have about 10 minutes and I have about four and a half billion years to cover <laughs> history with you, so I should probably get started. So if we move on. So this is our class out at the site, and we're looking at how can we read the landscape? What are the clues that we can find on the landscape that corroborate other stories that we've heard in our classes or in textbooks or wherever? So to do this, Thoreau, when he was looking at human culture and civilization, he looked at ants and drew analogies from ants to human characteristics, virtues, etc. Another guy, Sam Stahl, looked at the history of humans through the lens of cats and then later dogs. But we chose a different tack, so we studied wildlife. The, these are the different layers. We studied wildlife, the cultural layer, geology, vegetation and hydrology. And then we pieced all these uh, different clues that we got into some sort of coherent story. So I'm going to try and pass along that coherent story and answer the ultimate question of how do we get from this in pre-Cambrian times to this, the Leduc farm in modern times. And again, mo or not again, but uh, most of the photos that you'll see in the slide are taken by either myself or other students. So this is what Vermont, before Vermont was even a twinkle in uh, plate tectonics eyes, would have looked like. So this is about 4.5 billion years ago, and there'll be a time tracker up at the corner. So 4.5 billion years ago, there are no continents, the atmosphere is not really uh, hospitable to life, so there is no life. And it's not until about 700 million years later that we get our first signs of life, which would be bacteria. Now obviously this isn't bacteria, this is a state flower red clover. But if you look at it, um, and this is all over the property, uh, there are little root nodes, or nodes on the roots, and those store bacteria, which show the symbiotic relationship that they have to change the atmosphere uh, so that this red clover can use nitrogen. This is Vermont. <laughs> Be pretty nice. Uh, about 500 million years ago, Vermont was on the coast. There was no New Hampshire, no Maine yet. And there were also no plants in, on the land or animals on the land. So the landscape would have been pretty barren. Everything would have eroded away uh, into the oceans. The oceans were filled with small little microorganisms and animals that would have had calcium carbonate shells. Well, when calcium carbonate animals die, um, then their shells collect at the bottom and turn into sedimentary rock known as limestone. Well, here's our limestone. So this is a quarry just southwest of the Leduc uh, Bandel properties. And then here is an example in situ. So uh, what am I pointing at? Limestone outcrops, where are they? There's one right next to James, and there's the other. So this is our evidence of when Vermont used to be on a coastline. Uh, 440 million years ago, again, there were, before this, there were no plants on land. So moss, the first invaders of the terrestrial ecosystems. 
establishes itself, and you can't tell, I know, but uh, that's a rock, so it's on barren surface. So there's no soil development yet. So 440 million years ago, we have plants invading the land, moss clinging to rocks. Flash forward, so New Hampshire decides to join the Union. This, um, it came from Africa, by the way. Uh, so we have the different uh, continental plates moving towards one another and form, uh, moving towards the, uh, ultimately, the supercontinent Pangaea. So welcome, New Hampshire. About this time, you also have uh, the rise of amphibians, and on shore, you don't, or you have the invasion of plants now. So, outside of aquatic terrestrial or aquatic ecosystems, you um, you now have a food source. So, amphibians obviously exploit water and uh, terrestrial habitats during their lifetime. So, this is a wood frog egg mass in one of the vernal ponds. Uh, we have 300 million years ago. That's a painted turtle state reptile um, 300 million years ago in one of the vernal pools as well. So 250 million years ago, Pangaea forms, and the continent in the or the supercontinent in the middle is super dry. There's not a lot of access to water. It's very arid, very cold in some of the higher elevations. And so this is a hemlock uh, stand on the property, and hemlocks share a lot of those adaptations those, that those initial conifers that evolved during this time would have had. Dinosaurs, one of my favorites. So dinosaurs would have been the top predators uh, at the time during Pangaea and then 200 million years ago is when Pangaea starts to split, split apart. So fossil evidence in Vermont, Vermont, no, no dinosaurs here, maybe in Connecticut River Valley. But we don't have them, but we have living dinosaurs, small little constellation. So living dinosaurs are birds and pileated woodpecker, or pileated woodpecker holes at the top, yellow warbler nest. I think it's a yellow warbler. Maybe someone can correct me later. And then this is a great horned owl. We actually saw another great horned owl when we were out at the property being chased off by crows. So we saw that yesterday. And this is a dead one that we found. 150 million years ago, uh, we have flowering plants that sort of co-evolve with lots of uh, birds and insects. And so these start to proliferate and expand across the different uh, continents that have now diverged. Cataclysmic collapse of a lot of stuff 65 million years ago, goodbye dinosaurs, and enter the mammals. So it starts with small mammals, shrews and stuff, and so we have remnants. Um, on the left we have, yeah, on the left there, that's probably a vole tunnel from the winter, and then on the right those are either vole tunnels or shrew, and then the top right is actually a mouse cache uh, inside of a, an abandoned bird nest, which is a pretty cool find. 110,000 years ago now, so getting closer towards human perspective, we have glaciation. This is the start of the Wisconsin Glacier. And the Wisconsin Glacier is about two miles high of ice on top of Vermont. Not a lot survives. In fact, nothing survives. The only thing that really survives is glacial till, which came from further to the north. So glacial till on the right. Soils are scraped clean, so we basically start from scratch when the glaciers start to melt. Glaciers start to melt about 13,000 years ago. The glacial melt opens up the St. Lawrence River, which floods uh, water from the Atlantic Ocean into the, what's now the Champlain Valley. Uh, this whole area would have been inundated with salt water at this time. This is the beluga whale, or champ, perhaps. Um, it's a beluga whale from the Atlantic, and they would have lived here along with Paleo-Indians, which would have been exploiting, uh, this obviously is not here, but there would have been mammoths, uh, mastodons, elk, um, and other herds of large game that would have supported Paleo-Indians living on the landscape. In the wake of the park tundra conditions on the last slide, uh, this is now we have the climates warming even more, nine and a half uh, thousand years ago. This is a spruce for fir forest, not here. But, um, and then it warms even more, we get northern hardwood forests, so in this picture we have birch, maple, um, some beech trees, and then hemlock in the back. So that's about 7,000 years ago, climate continues to warm a little bit, and we have uh, the Abenaki culture, which is more sedentary, so they can't exploit the large game as before, so agriculture becomes increasingly important. This is a dugout canoe that was uh, excavated out of Shelburne Pond, and this is from about 500 years ago, and the Abenaki culture continues up to this day in the area. And then we have European uh, settlement in the area. 220 years ago, the Slocum family actually buys the property that's, that we're now referring to as either Bandel Farm in one area of it or Leduc surrounding that. 
And in this slide, there's some scrap wood, which is from uh, old construction projects. And uh, so this is just sort of symbolic of some of the, the different developments, uh, different styles of living that would have been available to humans. This is a rock wall. So the more modern history, I'm just going to show you some slides, and then you can extrapolate and sort of guess at what these might have been. Because these are familiar all over the landscape. But this is a rock wall here, so not necessarily for delineating property uh, lines. You wouldn't just put up this, it would have taken a long time. So more for keeping in cattle, or sheep, as it were, 180 years ago. And then flash forward a little bit, we have a development of barbed wire fencer, fence being swallowed there by a hemlock tree, and there's a sugar maple in the background. And it's pretty big, never been cut, so that would have been most likely tapped for maple, uh, or for sap, which would have been used for maple syrup as you well know. And all throughout the property, there are all these great little artifact finds um, that give you clues into different use of the landscape. Um, you can trace sort of the evolution of human culture over this by looking at it. Turpentine, uh, bottles for whatever, there's aluminum, there's plastic in there, incandescent light bulbs. So you have a whole history in the landscape that you can uh, read. So this is from a flight that I took with Ian Worley looking over the property south towards Shelburne Pond. So there are tons of elements within the landscape that we can look at and uh, piece together this story. But that's looking at the past, and so I'm going to pass it on now to uh, my colleague Rafter, and Rafter's going to tell us more about how we can look at this landscape in terms of future developments. So let's start shifting our focus and shifting our context from the past of the landscape to its future. And let's see if this works. <laughs> okay, and we'll be on manual. Here, I'll just slide this up here. Yep. All right, a little more freedom of movement also. There we go. So I'm Rafter Ferguson, and I'm a permaculture designer and teacher, and I'm in the graduate program at UVM. And I'm working in a group of graduate and undergraduate students, David Asmussen, uh, David Bro, Benjamin Crockett, and Sarah Williams in a class taught by Professor Sarah Lovell. And our project is to create an ecological master plan with common roots for the Leduc property. And I should have written more jokes. <laughs> I probably won't be very funny on purpose. Um, so our design process is to gather a lot of detailed information about this landscape from as many sources as we can, and uh, as the landscape exists today, and explore the potential of that landscape through the lens of the, of the Common Roots vision of their goals. Um, the goals of creating a multifunctional landscape that is also a community gathering place that produces long-term ecological and economic sustainability. And the guiding ethic running through this process is the idea of letting the landscape lead. We come to the landscape with our bundle of goals and desires and vision, and then we let the characteristics of the landscape itself, let the health of the landscape inform us as to how and where to get those needs met. Land, as has been said, as has been repeated tonight, is the basis for everything that we do. And in, in many parts of society today, we have sort of temporarily lost our grasp of that basic fact. And so I and we and, and the project group are really excited about Common Roots because they seem to be involved in this sort of historic undertaking of bringing the landscape back into the foreground of our awareness as a place that not only is the place over there where our food came from at some point, but it's the place that we go to harvest, to eat, to contemplate, 
to celebrate and to make ourselves a home. And so I'm going to present to you a slice of the analysis that we did on the Leduc parcels and just a little sketch of, of our vision, of our proposal for what we think would constitute the most productive, resilient, celebratory future for this particular landscape. So here are the boundaries of the Leduc parcels. They're on the, the border between South Burlington and Shelburne. Um, here's the creek that flows through um, uh, from north to south. Here's Cheese Factory Road uh, and the adjoining driveways. And so our analysis is based around really broad um, and fundamental questions of where's the sunshine? Where's the water? Where's the soil? So one of the first things that we look at is topography. So here's a topographic map of those same parcels. You can see the outlines of the parcels still in Cheese Factory Road. And the warmer colors, the hot colors, are higher elevations and the cool colors are lower elevations. So you can see how the land slopes down towards the creek. Um, and these are three foot contour lines. And so one of the first things that we pull out of this is that in the parcels themselves, it's mostly fairly gentle rolling slopes. So there's nothing that's steep enough that's going to seriously constrain anything that we want to do there. And we can even determine from this our sort of micro watershed. In that shaded area, all the runoff, all the rain runoff, all the water drains towards the center, towards the creek. And outside of that, it drains away and off the property. We can even get a little bit more specific than that. These arrows show not only the direction of water flow across the surface, but also where it will be concentrated in the landscape, with the green arrows draining in towards the creek and the blue arrows draining off. And looking at the landscape through that lens, the design principle at work here is that whenever possible, when we have sloping land and water moving across it, we want to intercept, slow down, and infiltrate that water into the soil. And so when, whenever possible, we will be placing all kinds of landscape components across those arrows, perpendicular to them. Um, garden beds, row crops, hedgerows, earthworks, will be placed to intercept that flow of water, spread it out, slow it down, let it sink in and passively recharge the groundwater, increase the productivity in our system, and alleviate any possibilities for erosion and soil loss. So where is the soil? <laughs> soil is not all the same, and don't dare call it dirt. <laughs> this, so this is a soil survey map. Um, which really only just begins to sort of scrape the surface of the complexity of soil types and doesn't even touch the complexity of soil ecology. But there's two important pieces of information for us to pull out of this tangle. And that's that we have about 18 acres of prime agricultural land out of around 140 total. And that we have an additional 106 acres of what are called statewide soils, which are also judged to be potentially very productive. And so this only tells us, these soil maps only tell us about the sort of structure and drainage, the physical characteristics of the soil. And so there's still more to learn about the life in the soil, about the soil biology, about the, the amount of nutrients, the fertility in the soil. And that we'll find out not by looking at a map, but by talking to the previous stewards of the land, talking to the Leducs, and uh, prolonged soil testing and observation for that, for that ground truth. And so we can tie that question of where's the soil um, to our question of where's the sunlight. And as it turns out, our prime agricultural land is also on primarily south-facing slopes. So the, the soils that are best suited to grow crops are also positioned to receive the most sunlight throughout the year. So that's an, that's an excellent, um, that's excellent luck. <laughs> and what areas are most fragile? What areas are, are vulnerable or rare? These areas are most uh, valuable to us when they are not being used intensively. And so we have a, a flood-prone riparian corridor, and riparian is just ecology talk for near a stream. Um, and this is, this is a type of system that's both fragile and easily disturbed, and also something 
for which our management practices clearly have an impact on our neighbors because it doesn't, the effects of our actions don't stay on the land at all. The quality of that stream uh, drains directly down into Shelburne Pond. And we have some clay plain forest. This was once the dominant ecosystem in the Champlain Valley, but due to the very high natural fertility in these systems, the vast majority of it has been cut down and used for agricultural land. And so it's rare and dwindling, and so we're lucky to be approaching being able to have stewardship over some pieces of that, that forest. And the land drains to the creek and the creek drains to Shelburne Pond. And so we've got a few reasons to be mindful of that relationship. One, that we want to be good ecological neighbors to Shelburne Pond on the south. And also that um, strategically we can think about how we can capitalize on having sort of public interest and attention and activity sort of immediately in our area, maybe by connecting nature trails. And so to start to tie this in to our proposals and our design work, um, this area here is where all the infrastructure is currently concentrated, and it's also where any future development will take place. So our design sort of radiates out from that center. And this is not at all sort of finalized or fully worked out, but current thinking is that that is roughly where a teaching center and community center would go. And so we'll be concentrating um, vegetable production, organic vegetable production in a rotational crop system in the area, in the prime agricultural land that's immediately around the farm complex. And just to the east, we propose creating an edible forest garden. This is a a style of food production that's inspired by Native American forestry practices, by permaculture design, by contemporary forest ecology. And what we're doing is creating a food forest, creating a forest ecosystem from the ground up, but that's loaded with yields for human use, fruit and nut production in particular. And we would be creating a sort of naturalistic park-like atmosphere, but one that's sort of dripping with fruits and nuts throughout the growing season a little piece of temperate climate Garden of Eden. Ag uh, educational activities for younger school age children would be concentrated, and I'm sorry, sorry the contrast is not very high on this, would be concentrated in a block at the northern end of the prime agricultural land. And the contour of the land, the topography suggests these two locations for farm ponds. Um, with ponds here and here, we could passively irrigate virtually all of the rest of the southern parcel uh, by gravity alone. Uh, the southeastern pond could have a wetland component to filter any residual runoff coming from the farm complex, and both the ponds will be increasing biodiversity, adding wildlife habitat, and bringing more beauty and recreational opportunities to the landscape. Rotational silvopasture. Kind of a mouthful, but all this means is that in the areas where we will be uh, managing the land with sustainable pasture practices, with rotational grazing, which is a style of pasture management that just increases the fertility of the system, the more, the longer that you manage the landscape in that way. And those areas will also be growing trees um, as hedgerows, as windbreaks, as buffers, as living barns, and that those tree plantings will also be producing uh, food and medicine for humans, forage and shade for animals, habitat for wildlife, improving soil fertility, and alleviating the possibility of erosion. This area being a little bit further away from the farm complex probably is not going to get a lot of attention in the initial phases of the project, so it makes sense to invest in uh, low-maintenance, long-term investment crops. Um, like black walnut, hybrid American chestnuts, um, even experimental crops like canker-resistant butternut, which um, the introduction of which and the trials of which would really be a service to the, the whole region. And of course, the obvious and necessary thing to do is to set aside that clay plain forest for research, conservation, educational purposes. Oh, did I go back? There we go. <laughs> 
And to protect the fragile riparian system, we're proposing a, uh, for 100 feet on either side, planting wet-loving, flood-adapted woody species um, to, in order to protect that system and to prevent erosion, to preserve the quality of the stream. And just because we're protecting that system doesn't mean that we can't be getting yields from it as well. Um, honey locust for animal forage, sweet sap, silver maple, um, hybrid, hybrid uh, swamp oak for sweet acorns, service berries, ginkgo, um, cranberry, aronia berry, the list goes on and on of ways in which we can be protecting a landscape and harvesting from it at the same time. So there it is. That's our sketch of our ideas of how we can approach this landscape with a set of goals and let that landscape inform how and where we're getting those met and let, us, let it show us how to collaborate with it um, and provide multiple functions for the community that's stewarding it. And so here's a, this is a, a sketch of that design by Ben Crockett, who's a member of our project group. Common Roots has asked, asked us to look at the lens, look at the land through the lens of their community vision because it complements what they seek to do, which is strengthen the community through working with the land. And I and we are all happy and proud to be contributing to that vision. Thank you. My name is Leah Mattel Skiff, and I'm also a South Burlington resident. I've been here with my husband for, I should have added it up, it's been a while now, um, about 15 years. And we have two young children, one who just started as a kindergartner in the Orchard School District, right next to Carol McQuillan's room. So I'm going to talk a bit about what we're going to do on this land that we've been telling you so much about. I'm going to advance this just a little bit. And so something I learned recently that is a prediction of the USDA is that over the next 15 years, 70% of our farmland in this country, which is 400 million acres, a number kind of too big to conceive, is going to change, is going to transition or change hands. And so as a community member of this area, um, and along with my Common Roots team members, we're so thankful to the Leduc family for having, the, for having stewarded their land for the four generations of dairy farming. And for along with the Land Trust, working for five years in partnership with the Land Trust to conserve this property. So before I begin, I want to ask the Leduc family and Alex Wiley and John Rowe of the Land Trust to stand up and just give them a heartfelt thank you for conserving this property. acreage changing hands over the next 15 years and with the average age of Vermont of farmers in the Northeast being 55 there's a tremendous opportunity in this community and tremendous opportunity across the nation for how land will be used in terms of food production in terms of environmental stewardship in terms of community recreation and wildlife habitat and what an amazing opportunity this family and the land trust has given this community to start with, in talking about this land, the Land Trust and, um, and the Leduc family will be conserving this land on September 30th of this year. And in, as Carol spoke about, the Land Trust has given uh, Common Roots the opportunity to give the first proposal for using this land for our vision. And they have, they'll be, per we'll be 
raising money to purchase this land at its conserved agricultural value at $250,000. So our first, fundraise, our first fundraising goal as an organization is going to be for the purchase of this land and also to establish our organizational and farm infrastructure to get the program and the agricultural production off the ground. So we'll be in our first, fund, um, first phase of this fundraising, we'll be ra raising half a million dollars to get this to purchase the land and get going as an organization. Um, this opportunity, as Rafter so well articulated, begins with the land, and it begins with the expression of the land. It also begins with the needs of the community to secure local food production, and the opportunity we have to weave an ethic of environmental and civic responsibility into our K-12 curriculum. So the Common Roots vision to bring the Leduc family is to bring, is, excuse me, to bring, bring the Leduc farm into sustainable, diversified production. So beginning with the lead of the natural resources of the land, we'll build on the amazing work of these graduate students of Teague and Rafter and their colleagues and establish and spend the, fir the first full year, 2010, further site planning, further building the farmscape and the master site plan, establishing some of the perennial plantings, and by taking advantage of some of the amazing, innovative, sustainable farming techniques that are um, so widely used in this community and, and nationwide, the farm will grow food to use in our area, our school kitchens in the Chittenden County area, and also um, to for our area residents through uh, community-supported agricultural memberships. And by joining many Vermont residents and farmers, some of them are in this room, like Bruce Hennessy and Beth Whiting and Eric and Keenan Rosendahl, who practice amazing um, farming techniques to bring local food to this area, as well as restaurants and other organizations who have taken some huge leaps and leads to securing local food economies. One of the primary missions of Common Roots is to work on securing local food production. And what that means is creating a local food economy where we are, instead of bringing a tomato that comes from halfway across or all the way across the country that is picked before it is ripened, that is artificially ripened by chemicals in a truck as it's coming across the country to our school trays or to our plates, that we're looking more locally, supporting our farmers, creating an economy that makes local food consumption and local food marketing more viable and also looks at the needs of our entire community so that we can feed our community in ways that are sustainable and affordable and healthy and in line with dietary needs and nutritional needs. And so as we look to the smaller radius for our food production in our community, we're looking to um, bring, to partner with other area farmers to use our buying dollars from an institutional level and from a small residential level to embrace our community, embrace our ability to um, bring more farm, more food into production locally. Another um, part of our vision for Common Roots is place-based education, which is a term that was born out of hands-on learning, which, what, which brought more tactile methods into the classroom and then grew into experiential learning, which brought students out into the, out of the classroom and more into the environments, and paired in a lot of ways with service learning, which builds a curriculum around the needs of the community. I forgot, I was, I was gonna have my clicker and then I forgot I was gonna do it on my own. Um, in terms of, in, if we look at place-based education, students and children, they want and they have the ability to be involved in meeting the challenges environmentally and culturally, economically, socially in their community. If you look at curbing runoff pollution or um, our friend Haley who is helping to the diminishing bee population or combating hunger in our communities, there's an ethic of responsibility that starts in the kindergarten years and starts even before the kindergarten years when kids have that magic of, I want to save the world, and they know that they can. That, that my son talks about 
saving the rhinoceros population, and that's what we should dedicate our needs to, and it's very real and possible to him. And the magic of, of observation and interaction and that ethic of saving the world only flourishes as we move into adulthood, and when children have the ability to interact in their environment, make positive change, know that their abilities are valued now, that they can help restore an ecosystem, that they can understand the components of a local food system, that they're not just preparing for someday out there, hopefully they'll choose a career that'll help save the world, but that they're acting now while preparing to make those choices for the future. And so they are leaders today, they're leaders tomorrow, and they're leaders 10 years from now. And it's a powerful way to weave into our curriculum their ability to make a difference, their belonging in our community, the fact that they matter. They matter now, they matter every day, and they are an integral part of this community. And they're not just going to school and magically coming home, and hopefully someday we'll use what we, what we learn in class. But there are daily opportunities to weave that, those traditional skills in the classroom into what they're doing in their ability, what they're doing outside of the classroom, um, and uh, their ability to make a difference every day. In terms of the educational programs, com the Common Roots programs will be a wide spectrum from hour-long field trips that have activities such as animal tracking or composting or making mozzarella cheese uh, to longer week-long programs that might look like building a understanding of how do you create an agri a local food system, looking at the agricultural and political and social and economic components of supporting a local agricultural, I'm sorry, a local food um, system and buying locally, selling locally, sourcing locally. What are the implications of that? And building a whole, having students come for an entire week and, um, and building on understanding all the components of that system. Ultimately, our goal would be to have month-long and semester-long programs where middle school students, for example, would be on the Common Roots campus for their 8 to 3 o'clock school day every single day for the entire semester. And that the traditional skills that they learn in the classroom would be learned on our campus and woven into the context of this experiential learning. <laughs> um, so I'm going to pass this back to Carol McQuillan, who is uh, going to give us a, I'm sorry, uh, to Alec Webb. Yes, that's the new Carol. <laughs> the new Carol. It changed a little, just a little bit. <laughs> um, Carol just turned around and asked if, I, if I'd share just a couple thoughts before she concludes the program. I'm Alec Webb. I'm president of Shelburne Farms, and Megan and Carol were coming through the farm barn a week or two ago. and. Carol's enthusiasm was I could feel it coming around the corner into the office. Um, but it made me think back to the um, early days in uh, the 1970s when Shelburne, we were first envisioning Shelburne Farms becoming a nonprofit. And there weren't many people back then who would have bet that we could have come as far as, as we have. Um, but I, we know that passion for an idea and enthusiasm can really go a long way. And I just hope. Um, well, we just wish Common Roots all of the, the best as they set out on their journey and, and hope that it turns out even better than you can imagine today. Thank you, Thank you Alec. I appreciate that. So we can't see 40 years into our future, and I'm sure Alec couldn't, Alec couldn't see 40 years ago that their mission and vision would have encompassed and affected so many teachers, children, community members, tourists, and the web of their influence around the state and nation, and then their partnership with Japan, uh, continues to um, inspire me. So I'm very proud to be part of the connection with Megan and her team. As part of being part of their team, I had an opportunity last summer with um, the invitation of Tom Hudspeth, Tom Hudspeth and Megan Camp to spend a week with very talented people at Champlain College to spend it with uh, Peter Senge, a mentor of organizational change. In the context of our vision and mission, he says this, 
Learning organizations are those where people continually expand their capacity to create the results they truly desire, where new and expansive patterns of thinking are nurtured, where collective aspiration is set free, which we will find with our UVM connections, and where people are continuing to learn and see the whole together. In his recent book, Education, the Necessary Revolution, Peter Senge says, and I iterate, reiterate his words, we do not have time to waste. If we are going to meet the challenges of our future in this 21st century, we need to capture the energy, the talent, and the commitment of our youth. And I love that Peter Senge wove this Albert Einstein quote into our week. He says, insanity is doing the same things over and over and over again, expecting different results. So I'd like to live with that um, convocation for change. And I'm going to abbreviate my ending uh, this evening. Our core team of Common Roots knows that for fact, that raising a half a million dollars to purchase the Leduc property, to develop the first um, directorship positions to move us forward. We've had lots of people working uh, many long hours for a year now, and it's time to begin paying some part-time directors to move this forward. And it's also time for us to begin developing that site plan with the family of the Ladukes willing to consult and confer with us along with our other partnerships. So we know it's going to be challenging in these economic times, and yet we know that our human spirit is strong. An appropriate analogy may be one of my favorite folk tales, the story of stone soup. We know that there was nobody in the village who seemed to have any food for the outsiders who entered. And yet with the imagination and the tenacity, each member of the community did indeed have something to put into the pot. And when the soup was cooked, they shared in the festival. Now this is wisdom. To the wise, life in fact is a festival. It's going to take us a half a million dollars to stir up this vegetable soup for our community. We believe that we can do it. How each of us, you and I, spend our time, our talents, and our money is what translates to having meaning in our lives. Tonight, we're inviting you to ponder the specific question that we have at hand. Am I willing to help secure the Leduc Farm for the mission and vision of Common Roots? We will be contacting you and inviting you to participate with us. It will take a committed community, each of us doing our part. We thank you for this evening together. We are very grateful for this place. And after Jean and Eric and Jean-Luc close in song, we're going to invite you to stay for more food. We have dessert. And we'd like to leave you with a very essential question tonight. What action shall I take to preserve for the future the roots of our past? Thank you. And so we'll close this evening <clears throat> with a song by Jean, Jean-Luc, and Eric. They, I asked them on the way over in the car, what song would you choose in your repertoire to lead people with. And they chose the song that speaks the title of their group, Estar. Estar means to be, the same verb être in French. And so they feel that in their words as they speak, that we are here, we are, we are existing now. And as Carol said, now is the time. And that's why, without having consulted with Carol before, they chose the time and the words for tonight. And so <clears throat> they're going to close with that. And I'd like to close, too, by holding high something that was given to me in the Pyrenees 40 years ago. I, have no, I don't know why this happened, but in a tent, under a tent with 2,000 people, a young Basque woman got up on the stage and said, we have a gift for someone in this room whose eyes speak to us. She had no idea I was doing a study of the French Shepherds. 
and with Fran, and we were sitting in the audience, and an hour and a half later, she wound her way through the audience. She came up to me and she, she said, c'est pour vous, monsieur. And she handed me, just the way they do at Middlebury College, the famous cane, she handed me the shepherd's stick. And I learned later, when I, when I asked my, my shepherd friend, what, what is the origin of this wood? And he said, well, you know, it's boxwood, and it will last forever. So may this common root that grew this box would be part of your program, Carol. And congratulations on a wonderful, wonderful initiative. Estar. Thank you. 